Hi, my name is Frank Pergola. I'm a retired New York City detective, homicide squad detective. Uh, I did 30 years in the New York City Police Department. I was born and raised in Bath Beach, Brooklyn, New York. I became a police officer because I was looking for a pension and a decent salary. About seven years, I was promoted to detective in 1972, came on a job in 1965. Uh, my aspirations were to become a first grade detective. You have three steps, third grade detective, second grade detective, first grade detective. Uh, the homicide angle came after I was in four different homicides over a 12 year period of time. And that's what I love to do. My grandparents came from Italy. They migrated here. They, they lived in lower Manhattan and they moved to Bath Beach later on. My father and mother were born here. Uh, it was a diverse neighborhood, middle class. Most of the guys I grew up with, they either were firemen, cops, took over their father's business, or they were mobsters. I mean, I had four organized crime storefront clubs from four different crime families in my neighborhood. And, you know, I, I grew up with most of these guys. And some of them became very high up in the uh, organized crime families. And you knew who they were? I knew who they were. And, uh, I mean, they respected me and they respected my family. I always had, one of my qualifications for being a good detective was, was I always respected people. I never disrespected them. I always treated them well when they were arrested. And, and they knew that, you know. I worked all over the city. I was in four different homicide squads. My first one was the Son of Sam Task Force. Uh, there were four shootings, and the chief of detectives sent myself and six other detectives into the uh, 15th homicide zone in Queens. And we were to establish if this shooter was a serial killer or not. And we did that. Uh, and then about Two months later, a girl named Vashkachian, a single girl walking in the street, was killed by the son of Sam. And the chief of detectives uh, assigned 60 detectives, including myself and my partner, to the son of Sam task force in a 109 precinct. It was situated right at the, uh, right at the Triborough Bridge, so most of the homicides or shootings were going down in Queens and the Bronx, so we could transport we could transfer back and forth between Queens and, and the Bronx. Uh, it was six, six, six ten-man teams, and uh, myself and my partner, Jerry Shevlin, were uh, assigned to work 4 p.m. to 8, uh, 8 a.m. every day. Uh, first couple of hours, we would do interviews, and we did in the, in the few months that we worked there, we did about 300 interviews of suspects. We tried to eliminate them, and mostly they were eliminated. The complaints came from suspicious uh, citizens who volunteered information about people they thought was the son of Sam. One interesting aspect of that was we uh, Somebody turned in a guy named Mickey Featherstone, who was a member of the Westies organized crime family. And uh, we knew it wasn't right, but we, went, we had to go and interview him. So we went to Manhattan and we sat in his office and we discounted him as a subject. But strangely enough, 10 years later, when I was working in the organized crime homicide task force, he was part of a RICO investigation and he ended up arresting him 10 years later for numerous murders. But he wouldn't cooperate, and he did cooperate, but he wouldn't cooperate until we cleared him of a homicide that he was in jail for. So me and my partner went out and we proved that he couldn't have done it, you know, by the time limit and, and uh, so on and so forth. So he cooperated and he gave us 10 other Westies that uh, all got life, life with no parole and they're still in jail. I was assigned to the Major K Squad the chief detectives assigned me to the U.S. Attorney's Office in the Southern District of New York. And uh, I was to do their organized crime homicides to investigate them. I had one or two partners uh, to do that. We worked with the FBI. We worked with uh, 
postal authorities, we worked with all federal agents. They made, they made us U.S. Marshals so we could carry our guns all over the country, and that's how I got involved with Mon Monticlia. Uh, we were looking for him because he, we knew he was associated with that organized crime family that we were working on, and they were suspected of doing over 200 homicides. We identified those homicides, we investigated them, and due to Dominic and maybe four or five, maybe even 10 other uh, informants, we were able to clear, uh, when I say clear, I mean find out who actually did these homicides by their information. We went out and corroborated what they did. We were able to clear 200 homicides. We charged 50 of them in the indictment, and there were 25 perpetrators, and they all went to jail, life, no parole. We worked in the 15th, uh, 15th homicide zone. We were only six detectives there, and we were supposed to verify if that was a serial killer. We did that. Uh, then there was this single girl that got shot by the son of Sam and killed, Foscaccian, and uh, that was in March of 1977. The chief of detectives assigned 60 detectives to the 109 the Son of Sam Task Force. Uh, as far as I knew, we were called the Son of Sam Task Force, and I've been asking the past, uh, was it the Omega Task Force? And I said, you know, we never knew it by that, but I can tell you this, Sam in one of his six notes called us Omega because he was into all the satanic stuff, you know, so uh, the name didn't register with me anyway. I mean, the real on-hands, Supervisor there wasn't supervisors, weren't Dowd. There were uh, Sergeant Eddie Dallum, Sergeant Joe Coffey, uh, Captain Joe Borelli. Those were the guys that knew the case, knew the homicides. Captain Borelli was riding around with a clairvoyant. Somebody that could tell the future was trying to pinpoint where this guy might hit again. I mean, he was working off of that, you know. And, uh, well, it never came to fruition anyway. <laughs> but you try anything. Yeah, did you have any clues? Actually, we got no breaks. The only break we got is he made a mistake and he hit in Brooklyn. First he was hitting in the Bronx. Then he hit four times in Queens. Then back in the Bronx again. Now he hits in Brooklyn almost a year to the date he committed the first homicide. And it was right around the corner from my house. Now, myself and my partner were assigned that evening up in the Bronx on patrol in these Lover's Lane areas because that's where he was shooting. We hear the call come over, and I started to panic because I'm right around the corner. I live right around the corner. I got a 17-year-old daughter. We were concerned. So we got there. I think it took 20 minutes to go, go from the Bronx to Brooklyn, which was amazing. Uh, by the time we got there, the place was flooded with emergency service, the two bodies were still in the car, they were still alive, and uh, they took them out, took them to Coney Island Hospital. She didn't survive, he did. He's alive today, but he can't see, he's blind. He got shot in the head. The scene was a mess, I mean, there was blood, body tissue, uh, poor girl laying there, limping the, limp the car, and him too, you know. So then we, we stayed in, with, the t with the 10th homicide zone, and uh, those were the local homicide detectives from Coney Island. And we did a canvas, we spoke, we stayed till 8 o'clock in the morning, and we went to the precinct and interviewed the sector car that had that patrol that night. And we thought maybe, he maybe they might have issued a summons to some car or something, and we asked them explicitly if they did that, and they said, no, no, we don't remember doing anything like that. Okay. Well, there was one detective, a guy by the name of Jimmy Justice. He was working with the 10th Homicide Zone. He was a robbery squad detective. But he keyed in on that. And he went to the city of New York and he sat down and went over every summons for that night, for that area. And he located a summons issued to a car from Yonkers. When they checked the registration, they come back to a guy named Berkowitz who was the son of Sam. He made the mistake of striking in Brooklyn and he got caught. It was some place that he never went to. You know. 
We knew he was a serial killer because we had proved that basically from the four homicides. They, up until that point, there were no notes dropped or written. And then he started writing to a writer named Jimmy Breslin who lived in Jersey. He dropped a letter in Jersey. He went to Breslin who worked for the news or one of the papers. Uh, that's when the notes started. He was leaving a note by the, uh, by the crime scene sometimes. And they were all like off the wall. The guy was a, actually a paranoid, schizophrenic, narcissistic. And he was targeting young, young girls with dark hair. And apparently he felt, you know, when he was interviewed, he said, it was a lengthy interview. I wasn't there for it, but you know, only a chosen few were there for the interview because we took him to Manhattan, to headquarters, to do the interview. And uh, when I saw him, he was no different than our assumptions. He was a serial killer. He was a nut. He was crazy. And he was driven by these voices, he said. We later on find out that he made that up. You know, he just used that as an excuse. He felt he felt he was ignored by women. Uh, I mean, he was in the army for three years. And when he came out of the army, he was, I think he was working for the post office and he was actually an auxiliary policeman someplace in Bronx or the Queens, I don't even know. And anyway, here's what happened. When after the Moskowitz homicide, uh, Chief Captain Burley assigned myself and my partner to the 10th Homicide Zone to work with them. So we didn't have to go up to the 109 precinct. We stayed in Brooklyn. And we worked with the 10th Homicide Zone. This detective, Jimmy Just, found the summons and the car registered to Berkowitz and reported that to the 10th Homicide Zone. They sort of kept that a secret, didn't tell us anything about it, and we were working with them. And uh, they went ahead and drove up to the Bronx, located the car, looked in the car and saw a rifle and ammunition. So they went to Westchester County, applied for a search warrant. Now, whether or not they got the search warrant, I don't know, I don't remember. Anyway, they hit, they hit the apartment and they got Berkowitz coming out with a bag with the 44 caliber handgun that he was using, arrested him, went into the house and found a lot of satanic stuff on the walls and, uh, and uh, a journal. Now, this is something that we never even knew. In the journal, he had registered that he had committed 1,500 uh, arsons. He was burning buildings down. And he had it documented. Anyway, just that the guy was a homicidal maniac, you know, a serial killer. You know, we're not the only people that have serial killers. I mean, they're all over the country. I mean, I, I did a little research on that too. I mean, did you know that Colombia has a guy named Lopez that committed 300 of these serial, and he's still at large. I mean, and then England had, he did five, that guy. And uh, Russia had the guy that did 50. I mean, it's all over the world. The question was asked to me, do, do you think that the United States has more serial killers than anybody else? I don't think so. I think we have a lot of shooters, but most of them are uh, mentally ill people or terrorists. Those are the people that are killing hundreds right now. I mean, Sam only killed six, wounded seven, and he got 365 years. And he's still in jail 42 years later. And he don't want to come out. No, that never came to fruition because later on, the FBI interviews him in jail, and he sort of indicates that he made that all up. I mean, he said that he was the son of Sam. Sam is supposed to be a Labrador dog that lived up in Yonkers, whom he shot a couple of years before the dog survived. By the way, the dog's name wasn't Sam. The owner of the dog was named Sam. The dog was named Harvey. <laughs> the dog survived, though, thank God. <laughs> the climate in the city was, 
it was in crisis. You know, everybody, all the women were dying their hair, cutting their hair, staying home. They weren't going out meeting men. Uh, they were staying away from lovers' lanes. I mean, so the city was basically very quiet. When we went out at night at uh, 10 p.m. to 4 a.m., streets were vacant. You know, there was hardly any activity. The guy created a crisis. Well, I was the youngest guy on that task force. I was 39 years old at one time, and it was 41 years ago. I mean, there were some good detectives that I worked with. A guy named Billy Clark, a guy named John Clark. Task force detectives, some of them were excellent. The guy that made the arrest, Eddie Zigo, Joe Strano, they were excellent. And let me tell you something, the bosses that we had in that task force were unbelievable. I mean, Sergeant Eddie Dallum, he had vast experience as a homicide detective and supervisor. Joe Coffey, Joe Borelli, who turned out to be the chief of detectives later on. After the, uh, the Moskowitz homicide, myself and my partner were reassigned to 10th homicide in, in Brooklyn, where this thing happened. They were really responsible for that homicide because it happened in their district. So we were put there to assist them. And uh, we did things like going to Triborough Bridge and Tunnel Authority to check the videos to see if we could come up with a common car, uh, things like that. But the period right after the Moskowitz homicide, when they, f when they found the summons, and there was a 10-day lapse of time between, between the, uh, the time we got the summons and identified the guy uh, as Berkowitz. But there was, a, there was a competition created between the task force and, and the 10th homicide squad as to who was going to get credit for this thing. And, they sort of ran out on us and uh, didn't notify the task force until the arrest was made, and then they called us. And we responded to headquarters for the interview. Detectives are detectives. We, we always got along, you know. But uh, it was a status thing. It's, it's understandable. As I said before, I was in four different homicides. First, my first experience was the 15th homicide zone when we tried to establish the fact that he was a serial killer. And after that, I went to the 12th homicide zone, I think in about 79. We, we had four partners and we each caught maybe three, four homicides a month. And you know what? There weren't that many back in 79. But later on in 1982, when I was in the Major Case Squad and I was assigned to the U.S. Attorney's Office, the Organized Crime Homicide Task Force, and we were doing all the organized crime homicides, uh, I think the stats were up to about 2,000 a year. And I mean, it seems like you never hang, you know, you never hung up your hat. You were always on a run. Uh, after that, I, I was transferred into the Brooklyn South Homicide, where I attained the, grade, the first, first grade status of my detective lifetime, and uh, that was very fulfilling for me. But, you know, when I look back, until I got, until I got first grade in 1993, yeah, right, 1990, until I got, then I look back and I said, you know, I really got to be proficient at my job. I knew the job, I knew my department, and uh, it made me feel good about myself. It got me into this organized crime homicide task force. I was, uh, <laughs> I was like an expert. I don't know if you remember the guy, Sammy the Bull Gravano, the underboss. And the, he confessed to 19 homicides. Now the FBI has all this sketchy information about he killed Petey Pots and Pants on 18th Avenue in 1968. So they have this list of sketchy information, and who did they come to? They came to me because I know how to get this information out of the department. But it took me weeks, and I found every one of them. And I brought the folders to them on every one of them, the whole 19 of them.
No, what I was doing is, when I was doing this organized crime style, I just, you don't have the thing go, going, right? Yeah. It is going. Yeah. <laughs> anyway, I was doing this organized crime work for the, for the U.S. Attorney's Office. By the way, Giuliani was the U.S. Attorney at that time, and he targeted the organized crime families. In one of the cases, we had the U.S. versus Castellano, which is Gambino crime family. That's where we arrested 25 of these perpetrators for 50 murders that we charged. Uh, and then there was U.S. versus the Westies. And then there was another case the United States versus the Commission, which was all the bosses of these five crime families in New York. And one of the guys that got killed in one of the crime families, it was the Bonanno crime family, a guy by the name of Carmine Galanti, was killed in Williamsburg. And we find out that there was a girl in the tenement right above the restaurant where he got killed who was looking at it and saw the whole thing go down. What she saw was the two bodyguards of this guy kill him and take off. So now they couldn't find this girl. So we did some background and we did a little investigation. We found out she went to Puerto Rico. And lo and behold, they sent us to Puerto Rico, went to the rainforest without speaking a word of Spanish. We had one FBI agent with us that spoke Spanish. We found this girl. So I brought her back. <laughs> I put her in my basement, and she stayed there that night, and I drove her into Manhattan, and she testified against the two bodyguards, one who, one who later they, turns up dead in a barrel someplace in Jersey, and another one that's in jail now, and uh, she testifies, and my, I take her back to my house, my wife gives her all kinds of clothes to take back to Puerto Rico, to take her to the airport, she goes back to Puerto Rico. Then she's gotta come back again. So now I gotta to go to Puerto Rico again and bring it here. I put her in my basement again. And that, I didn't know what to do with her.